Ever wonder why you might have your mom's eyes and your dad's chin? Well, today we're going to do a deep dive into the world of genes and chromosomes to find out why. Yeah, it's really fascinating. You're taking a close look at chapter 13 of your biology textbook, all about meiosis and sexual life cycles. Get ready, because this is a wild ride through the cellular processes that make each of us completely unique. It's like a recipe book for life, right? Yeah, exactly. But instead of flour and sugar, we're dealing with genes and chromosomes. Okay, so let's break down those ingredients. What are genes, chromosomes, DNA? Mm -hmm. How does it all work? Well, think of your DNA as a massive cookbook. It's got all the instructions for building and running your body. And genes, those are like the individual recipes, like the specific recipe for eye color or maybe hair texture. Oh, I see. So the genes are organized within the DNA. Right. And the recipes aren't just floating around in there. They're organized. They're organized into chapters, actually. And those chapters are your chromosomes. So how do we get our own unique recipe book? You inherit it. Half from your mom and half from your dad. That makes sense. Yeah. That's why you might have your mom's eye shape or your dad's hair color. Exactly. It's like you're combining ingredients from their two separate cookbooks. That's so cool. So that's why we're not exact copies of our parents. We're a blend of the two. Precisely. But hold on. If we get half our chromosomes from each parent, shouldn't the number of chromosomes just keep doubling with every generation? That's a great question. And that's where this process called meiosis comes in. Oh, meiosis. Okay. okay. It's a special type of cell division, but this one happens only in our reproductive cells. You know, the ones that make sperm and egg cells. Right. Okay. And unlike regular cell division where cells just make copies of themselves, meiosis actually cuts the chromosome number in half. Okay. So it cuts them in half. So sperm and egg cells each end up with just 23 chromosomes, right? Exactly. One set of 23. That's so interesting. So it's like taking a chapter from each parent's recipe book and making a condensed version. I like that, a condensed version. But how does meiosis make sure that each sperm or egg cell gets a good mix of all those recipes? Okay, well, imagine shuffling those chapters before you make the condensed version. Oh, shuffling. Yeah. That's kind of what happens during meiosis. It's not just about having the number of chromosomes. It's about creating completely new combinations. Oh, that's cool. And this shuffling, it's key to understanding why we're all so incredibly unique. I like it. So instead of just copying the rest of your book, meiosis is like taking pieces from different chapters and creating something totally new. Absolutely. So we start with 46 chromosomes, and then meiosis cuts it in half to create four cells with 23 chromosomes each. Is that basically it? Well, not quite. There's another little twist to this cellular dance. Oh, tell me more. During meiosis, the first stage, homologous chromosomes. Remember, the pairs we get from each parent, they actually swap segments of DNA. Really? Yeah, it's wild. It's like taking two versions of the same recipe, say, chocolate chip cookies and swapping sections, like maybe oh. using pecans instead of walnuts in one. You got it. And that process is called crossing over. So it's not just shuffling chapters. It's like mixing up the instructions within each chapter. Exactly. So it creates even more variations, right. right? Wow. And these swaps, they happen at specific points called chiasmata. Think of them as the spots where those recipes get truly remixed. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And all of this happens even before the chromosomes line up for that first division. Wow. So this is getting complex. It seems like every step just adds another layer of uniqueness. This really does. Okay. So after all this mixing and matching, what happens next? Okay, well now those shuffled and slightly altered chromosomes, they line up right in the middle of the cell. They get ready for that first division. Okay, so they line up. But here's another key part of why we're so unique. It's called independent assortment. Okay, independent assortment. Tell me about it. So imagine those chromosomes, right? Uh -huh. Now they've got the remix recipes. They line up randomly. Each pair, one from mom and one from dad, can face either pole of the cell. And it's totally random, like flipping a coin for each pair. So for each of our 23 pairs, there are two possibilities. Mm. So that means there are millions of different ways those chromosomes can line up before they're divided. You got it. Oh, my gosh. And for humans, there are over 8 million possible combinations of chromosomes in each sperm or egg cell. 8 million. Just from independent assortment alone. And remember, this is on top of the variation created by crossing over. So by the time we get to the second stage of meiosis, where the chromosomes are finally split, we've already created a huge amount of diversity, haven't we? Yeah, it's incredible. If each sperm or egg cell already has over 8 million possible combinations, 
how many possibilities are there when they actually meet during fertilization? Oh, then we're talking astronomical numbers. We're talking 8 million multiplied by another 8 million. Oh, my gosh. So like 70 trillion. 70 trillion different possible combinations of chromosomes for each new person. Yeah. No wonder each of us is truly one of a kind. This whole process is mind boggling. It is, isn't it? And this mind boggling process is happening inside us all the time. Wow. But there's another piece to this genetic puzzle. The evolutionary significance of all this shuffling and reshuffling. Yes. Let's dive into that next. Sounds good. Okay, so we've established that meiosis creates a ton of genetic diversity. But like, what's the point of all this shuffling? How does it actually impact our lives, the world around us? Well, that's where natural selection comes into play. So you got to think of all these unique genetic combinations. It's like a vast pool of possibilities. Okay. Some combinations might be beneficial, some might be harmful, and others might be neutral, you know? Right. It all kind of depends on the environment. Okay, so we've got all these different recipes, but the environment gets to decide which ones actually work best. Can you give me an example? Sure. Imagine a population of rabbits, ah. and they've got varying fur colors thanks to meiosis randomly mixing up those genes. Okay, rabbits. Got it. Now, if those rabbits live in a really snowy environment, the ones with white fur are going to have a better chance of surviving. Right, because they can blend in. Exactly. They blend in, avoid predators, snag more food. <laughs> Smart rabbits. But the brown rabbits, on the other hand, they stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah, they're going to be easy targets. Exactly. So over time, those white rabbits are more likely to reproduce and pass on their genes. Yeah. Leading to, well, even more white rabbits in that population. Yeah. It's like the environment is placing an order, like, I'll have the white rabbit, please. Huh. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And that's natural selection at work. Yeah. It's not about consciously choosing traits. It's just about the environment favoring certain traits over others. Right. And meiosis, by creating this incredible diversity in the first place, provides all that raw material for natural selection to work its magic. It's a brilliant system. Like, meiosis is constantly experimenting with all these new combinations, and then natural selection is like the quality control, just picking the winners based on the environment. Makes sense that populations with more genetic diversity would be more resilient. It's like having a bigger toolbox. You yeah. Know? The more tools you have, the better equipped you are to handle anything that comes your way. Absolutely. A diverse population has a wider range of traits, which increases the chance that at least some individuals will have what it takes to survive and thrive, even when the environment throws a curveball. Right. But if sexual reproduction, with all the genetic shuffling, is so great for survival, why do some organisms still reproduce asexually? Like, cloning seems so much simpler. You're right. Asexual reproduction is more straightforward. It's like hitting copy and paste on the genetic code. Right. And in really stable, predictable environments, it can be very effective, it's quick, efficient, and it requires less energy. So it's like mass production versus custom design. Yeah. If the environment's consistent, just churning out identical copies makes a lot of sense. But what happens when that environment changes? That's when the limitations of asexual reproduction become really apparent. A mm -hmm. population of clones, they lack the genetic diversity to adapt to any new challenges. Oh. Imagine a disease comes along and sweeps through a population of genetically identical organisms. If one is susceptible, they all are. It could wipe them out. That's scary. Okay, that makes sense. So sexual reproduction with all of its complexity is like an insurance policy for a species. Okay. It might be more costly in the short term, but it pays off in the long run because it makes them so adaptable. Are there any examples of organisms that have just totally ditched sexual reproduction? There are. One of the most fascinating examples is the bazoloid rotifer. These tiny creatures, they seem to have just given up sex millions of years ago. What? No males, no meiosis, just females cloning themselves. No sex for millions of years. Mm -hmm. But how have they survived without all that genetic mixing of meiosis? That's what puzzled scientists for a very long time. But some recent research has uncovered their secret weapon. What is it? They steal genes. They steal genes? What? Are you serious? How does that even work? Well, it seems to be linked to their ability to survive extreme conditions, like drying out. When their environment dries up, they basically shut down. They go into a state of suspended animation. Oh, wow. And during that state, their cell membranes become permeable, allowing bits of DNA from other organisms, even different species, to sneak in. So it's like their recipe book is open source, 
accepting contributions from all over the place. Ah, exactly. And it's a pretty wild way to create diversity without actually having to do sexual reproduction. It really is. And I guess their success suggests that while sexual reproduction is a really powerful strategy, it's not the only way to achieve that genetic diversity. You got it. But it does kind of raise another question. If sexual reproduction is so great for making variation, why haven't all organisms evolved to reproduce that way? Well, there are trade-offs to every strategy. Right. Sexual reproduction, it's energetically expensive. Finding a mate takes time and energy. Meiosis itself, it's a really complex multi-step process. Yeah, I can imagine. But asexual reproduction, much simpler, much faster. So it's a balancing act. Organisms have to weigh the costs and benefits of each approach based on their environment and lifestyle. It really makes you appreciate how evolution has fine-tuned these processes over millions of years. But hold on, we've talked about all this mixing and matching of genes, even stealing them, but is there a way to actually introduce, like, brand new information into the genetic code? Ah, yes. That's where mutations enter the scene. And that's a topic for our final part. Okay, so we've explored this intricate world of meiosis. We even touched on gene theft. Now let's talk about mutations. Aren't those supposed to be bad, like the source of genetic disorders and stuff? Well, mutations often get a bad rap, but they're more than just the villains in the genetic story. They're actually the ultimate source of all genetic variation. Think of them as tiny little typos in that DNA code, like a missing letter here, an extra one there, maybe even a whole paragraph rearranged. So it's like someone spilled coffee on the recipe book, causing some of the instructions to blur or smudge. Sometimes it ruins the recipe, but I guess other times you might get something unexpectedly delicious. That's a great analogy. Most of these typos are neutral with no noticeable effect, and some are harmful leading to disadvantages. But a select few can be beneficial, giving an organism an edge in its environment. So mutations are like these random experiments in the genetic code. Most fail, some are harmless, but a select few create something new and awesome. Yeah, exactly. And those rare beneficial mutations are what fuel natural selection. Remember, natural selection doesn't create new traits. It acts on existing variation. And that variation ultimately stems from mutations. Right. OK, so without mutations, there would be no genetic diversity for natural selection to work with. It's like a deck of cards with only one suit. You can shuffle all you want, but you'll never get a full house. You need those other suits, those mutations, to make the game really interesting. Precisely. Mutations are like the wild cards in the deck of life. They introduce that element of surprise, that potential for something totally new. So from the intricate dance of chromosomes during meiosis to those random sparks of mutations, it's amazing how these processes all work together to create this huge diversity of life on Earth. It really is a testament to the power of biology, you know, to create both that continuity and change. It ensures that life not only persists, but also evolves and adapts to whatever challenges come its way on our planet. This has been such an incredible deep dive. I feel like I've learned so much and I have such a better appreciation now for the complexity and beauty of genetics. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It really is fascinating. The next time you're looking at a family photo, think about the intricate processes that led to all those shared features and those subtle variations that make each person unique. You know, we're all part of this grand evolutionary story, a story that's written in the language of genes, chromosomes, and mutations. Well said. And each of us carries a unique combination of those genetic elements. It's a legacy passed down through countless generations. It's a real testament to this remarkable journey of life itself. And it's a journey that continues with each new generation, thanks to the amazing processes we've been talking about today. Well, that wraps up our deep dive into meiosis and sexual life cycles. We hope you enjoyed this journey into the heart of heredity and evolution. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving deep into the wonders of science.